The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, as you know from registering, we're going to talk about the new SNAP um, food stamp time limit. Um, today, just to give you a quick overview of today's webinar, um, first we'll go over the basics of the time limit rule. After that, Louise Hayes at Community Legal Services will talk about the importance of screening AVODs for exemptions. Then we have Sandra Willis, the Division Director of SNAP Policy at Pennsylvania's Department of Human Services, who will talk about implementing the time limit at the county assistance offices and go through some examples. Uh, then Pamela Lay, who's Division of Employment and Training Policy Director at the Department of Human Services, will go over the community service portion of the um, how the rule will apply. And we will end with Rochelle Jackson, who is a public policy advocate at Just Harvest. And she'll be talking about the planning that they're doing out in Allegheny County so that individuals don't lose SNAP benefits and trying to um, make opportunities available for individuals to do their work and um, volunteer hours. So we'll start off um, on slide three, I think you can all see, which is basics of the um, time limit. So what is the time limit? This is a federal rule. So states have to enforce this federal rule, and it puts a time limit on SNAP benefits for able-bodied adults without dependents, also called ABODs. That's the lovely acronym that has been assigned to the folks that fit this category. Um, why is this rule around and coming into effect? Uh, this rule was created back uh, uh, by Congress back as part of welfare reform in 1996. So some of you who have been in this world for a while may remember that it was in effect for a while, for, for several years actually. But with the recession, high unemployment, um, pretty much across the United States qualified every state, including Pennsylvania, for a waiver. Um, not all states took those waivers, but Pennsylvania has been under a statewide waiver since 2009, so this rule has not been in effect. The waiver is now expiring, which is why we all need to worry again about this rule coming into effect. Uh, next slide. Uh, the basics of the what continued. Uh, the ABODs, uh, who are affected by this rule will be limited to three months of SNAP benefits in a three-year period. So unless they work or participate in a work program at least for 20 hours a week, and that's averaged monthly, so it has to be 80 hours a month, or they are in school or training at least half time, if they qualify for an exemption, and there are many um, types of exemptions that we'll go through later in the, the webinar, or if they volunteer or perform community service for 26 hours per month. So that those are the ways that they can make sure they're in compliance with the rule. And note that partial months of benefits don't count um, towards the time limit. Okay, next slide. And the who. So who is an ABOD? Individuals receiving SNAP who are age 18 through 49. So the moment someone turns 18 up until their day before their 50th birthday. Anyone in that age category that does not have a child under 18 as part of their SNAP household. So you need to keep in mind that you know some people live together but prepare food separately so they have different SNAP grants. If they are on a SNAP grant without a child, even if they're in a household with a child, it's, it's defined by your SNAP household. So as long as if they don't have a child under 18 as part of their SNAP household, then they are an ABOD. Um, if they do not meet an exemption, and if they do not live in a geographically waived area, another part we'll get to in the next couple of slides. Okay, next slide. When does this rule come into effect? The rule will apply again in 2016. Pennsylvania will use an option within the federal law to exempt all ABODs for January and February. So January and February will not count towards the three-month time limit, and that's something Pennsylvania specifically is doing. ABODs who are not exempt will be required to meet the work, training, or community service hours starting March 1st. 
So that's officially when the time clock will start ticking for ABOGs in Pennsylvania. The first month that an ABOG could possibly lose SNAP benefits due to the time limit will be June 2016, because if you have a three months of SNAP to use, that would be March, April, May. So June is the first month where any ABOG in Pennsylvania could start losing their benefits. And it's important for all of us to be using the time period between January and June, during that whole time period, to help all ABODs meet exemptions, find work, find education and training, or volunteer slots. So this whole time, you know, screening can be happening, and offices will be starting to do that. OK, next slide. And now Louise is going to take over on the where the, the uh, ABOD rule applies in Pennsylvania. OK. Um, uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, this is Louise Hayes at Community Legal Services. Um, so as Kathy said, this, uh, Pennsylvania has had a statewide waiver of the three-month time limit um, since 2009 because of high unemployment. That uh, waiver is expiring, but Pennsylvania has requested a new waiver for 2016 for the areas of the state that still qualify for a waiver because of uh, continued high unemployment. What's tricky is even though Pennsylvania requested this waiver back in February, uh, the federal government has um, only just, I, I understand, like within the last um, hour or so, <laughs> gotten back to the state um, uh, about uh, whether it has approved the state's request or partially approved the state's request. So stay tuned. We'll be sending an email and updating our website when we know for sure which areas of the state have a geographic waiver. Um, it sounds like that should be very soon, but for now, we know that um, the 29 counties that the state uh, was not able to even request a waiver for will definitely have the time limit. Uh, there are 24 counties and 12 cities um, that the Center on Budget and Policy Priority, which is a think tank in Washington, D.C., which um, works on these issues was very confident that the federal government would approve and grant waivers for. And then there were 14 other counties and um, some cities and uh, towns that the state requested waivers of, um, waivers for, and we don't know yet what the federal government said. So, um, Caitlin, can we see the map? Um, so uh, we are very sure that the, uh, the counties in white, the time limit will apply. The counties in dark blue, we're pretty sure, will be exempt. You notice that includes Philadelphia. The time limit uh, has never applied in Philadelphia since 1996. Um, and the light blue ones are um, uncertain. But we should know in um, a day or two, so stay tuned. Next slide. So moving on from the geographic waivers, um, uh, there are individual exemptions. The geographic waivers obviously apply to whole counties, but exemptions are for each individual person uh, may qualify for an exemption. Uh, perhaps because they are not able-bodied or they meet one of the other um, uh, exemptions in the uh, federal rules. Um, the Ohio Food Bank did a study of ABODs a couple of years ago that was really illuminating and found that large proportions of people who were identified as ABODs actually uh, were not able-bodied. Um, a third of them had uh, physical or mental limitations or had um, other uh, employability issues um, that might have qualified them for an exemption. So we really hope that people on this webinar, one of the key messages that they'll take away is that a lot of people qualify for exemptions and that you all can help them uh, by uh, 
screening individuals for exemptions, um, keeping back of the medical exemption form, um, and helping people claim exemptions if they qualify for them. So what are these exemptions? Um, first of all, people who are disabled obviously um, should not be considered able-bodied adults without dependents. Um, the definition of um, what counts as a disability is a little broader than usually in SNAP. Um, the SNAP rules, if you're receiving uh, VA benefits, if you're receiving um, a private employer-sponsored disability insurance, um, any sort of disability benefits would exempt you from the ABOD. Unfit for, unfitness for work is um, a, also a broader category than people may be used to thinking of. Um, the federal law gives states a lot of discretion in defining what constitutes unfitness for work. Um, and in addition, to having medical professionals be able to certify unfitness for work. Federal rules say if it's obvious that somebody um, is unfit for work, uh, caseworkers at the county assistance office can just um, narrate in the record this person is obviously unfit for work. So for example, somebody has a broken leg or is you know, sort of um, really psychotic, um, they do not need to bring in verification. Um, they could be just noted as obviously unfit. Uh, pregnancy is an exemption, um, and there's a number of others on, I think it's going to be slide 11. We'll have to uh, fix our slide to note that. Um, next slide, please, Caitlin. So the medical exemption form, this is um, a form that DHS is working on and is not yet finalized. When this is final, it, um, Community Legal Services will put it on our website. The Coalition Against Hunger will put it on their website. We hope that you all can uh, keep copies of this and give it to, to people that you um, see who are affected by the time limit and you think have physical and mental health issues that would prevent them from working. Um, the, definition of unfitness for work is not yet final. This form isn't final, but uh, we're hoping it will be something like, do you have a mental or physical illness or disability which reduces your ability to financially support yourself? Um, again, this is nothing like the SSI standard. And um, we're also hoping that the form will be uh, able to be completed by anybody that um, any medical professional whose work is reimbursed by medical assistance. Um, so it wouldn't have to be a doctor. It could include a um, mental health therapist, um, a drug or alcohol um, counselor, um, a wide variety of medical professionals. Um, next slide. And then there are some other exemptions. Uh, some of which uh, won't apply to many people, and some should apply to a fair number of folks. Uh, people who are caring for someone in their home uh, are exempt, or can be exempt from the time limit. So for example, say you've got a 47-year-old woman who's caring for, who lives with her mom and um, does caregiving for her mom, you know, maybe keeps track of the meds or, um, does other care for her mom. Uh, even if they are separate staff households, uh, that 47-year-old could be exempt from the time limit on the basis of caregiving. Somebody who is applying for or receiving unemployment compensation uh, is exempt from the ABOD rule. And I believe DHS can see that in their own computer system. Uh, Somebody who is enrolled or school, in school or training at least half time. Um, so uh, folks at community college, folks in um, uh, job training programs, you know, medical billing, whatever it is, um, if you're enrolled at least half time, you should be able to be exempt from the ABOD time. 
people participating in drug or alcohol treatment programs or mental health treatment programs um, are exempt. And we're hoping that the medical exemption form would be an easy way to verify that participation. Uh, people who are homeless. Um, and the SNAP definition of homeless is a little broader than what some people might think. Uh, it would include people who are doubled up with others um, for 90 days or less. Um, uh, people in homeless shelters, all of those folks would be able to be exempt in some form. People expected to return to work within 60 days. Um, and then a few um, really pretty obscure ones. Uh, people who, uh, where there's no work or education or training site um, uh, within an, an hour's travel time. Uh, uh, migrant farm workers expected to return to work within 30 days. And VISTA volunteers. Um, so again, our message is uh, keep these exemptions in mind and help people claim them. Um, so that people can keep their staff benefits. And I think next is uh, Sandy Willis of the Department of Human Services. Thank you, Louise. So I'm going to go over what's going on with the CAOs now and what's going to happen at implementation of the ABOG. Currently, um, staff have received training regarding the ABOG, the new time limits, the um, rules and the regulations. and as part of the implementation for ABOS, staff will be meeting with um, applicants and recipients who come into the office or who call in for either an application or renewal. Staff will be sharing with them the new ABOD requirements and the new ABOD um, time limit. So CO workers will review with individuals who are age 18 through 49 to determine what category they fall in. And if you see on the, ch on the chart um, below, we have the three categories. Individuals will either be exempt, which means they have a child under age 18 in the SNAP household. They'll be either identified as disabled or receiving federal or state disability. They can be exempt by being pregnant or also by meeting the federal or state exemption. And I'm going to go over a couple of examples for you so you can kind of put this into perspective um, on an individual or case basis. CO staff will review with individuals during this, um, this age bracket of 18 to 49 to see if they have met or are meeting the ABOD requirements. So CEOs will talk to um, individuals who come in or call in to see if they're currently working at least 20 hours a week averaged monthly to see if they're participating in an approved or in educational training, I'm sorry, an approved educational training program for 20 hours a week, if they're volunteering or performs community service at least 26 hours a month. And just a little note there for that um, educational training program for 20 hours a week, that does not include job search. So staff have been, have been informed in this and will share this with individuals as they're talking to them about the ABOD requirement. And then ultimately, after they've gone through all the exemptions and determined if the person is exempt or if they're actually meeting an ABOD requirement, if individuals do not fall into those categories, staff have been trained to go over the, um, the, the time limit for, the, for these ABOD individuals who are not meeting an ABOD requirement, which is they will get a three-month time limit of benefit. Next slide, please. So CEOs are to inform individuals of the time limit. The individuals that do not meet the requirements, so they're not exempt or they're not currently meeting the ABOD work requirement, during the SNAP interview, whether it's at redetermination or at application, CAO workers are explaining to, the, to these individuals that starting March the 1st of 2016, they will only be eligible for three months of SNAP benefits within this three-year period if they do not meet an ABOD work requirement exemption or geographical waiver. So staff are stressing this information to individuals as they come in contact with them during a recertification or an application. 
What I'd like to do is go over some examples for you of individuals that may or may not be exempt or meet a work requirement um, so you can get an idea of the certain situ scenarios that, are, that we're looking at. So example number one is an ABOT, exam ABOT exemption. So we have Derek who's 34 years old. He's a 34-year-old man. He lives in a non-waived area with his girlfriend, Amber, and her 13-year-old son, Jeremiah. They purchase and prepare their meals together. They apply for SNAP benefits and are found eligible. Does Derek meet any ABOT exemptions? I'm just going to wait for 30 seconds so you can think about that, and then I'll give you the answer. Next slide, please. Yes, Derek does meet an ABOT exemption because Jeremiah, who is under the age of 18, is part of his SNAP household. So he would be, Derek would be exempt. Let's go on to another example. Next slide, please. This is another example of an ABOT exemption. We have Mark. Age 24, he's a single man. He moved into a non-waived graphical area, and he's currently receiving unemployment compensation. Mark applies for SNAP. Does Mark meet any of the ABOT exemptions? Just wait for a few minutes for you to think about it. Next slide, please. Yes, because Mark is receiving unemployment compensation, he would qualify as meeting an ABOT exemption. Next slide. Example number three. Janice, a 47-year-old single woman with no children, lives in a non-waived area. She applies for SNAP and claims that she has a mental disability that prevents her from working. The disability is not obvious, so it's not something that the CAO worker can actually see or you know, um, be exposed to as they're doing the interview. She's given a PA-1921, the um, medical form, and she's asked to have her physician complete the form and then return it to the CAO. She does not, however, return it to the CAO by the deadline. Does Janice meet any of the ABOT exemptions? Next slide, please. No, unfortunately, Janet does not meet any of the ABOT exemptions, and she has not because she has not yet provided the certification of disability. So, because she did not provide the form back to the CAO, and it was not obvious that Janet was unfit for employment, she would be um, not exempt, and she would be subject to the ABOT three-month time limit of receiving the SNAP benefits. Okay, so those are the examples that I'm going to go over, and now Tamara Lay is going to go over the work activities. Thanks, Sandy. So in addition to meeting the requirement for ABOD participation through work, there are other um, avenues which um, we hope to be able to help find um, for our ABOD individuals. They're non-work activities to meet the 20-hour a week requirement. They include um, advanced degree or taking college classes, perhaps through a program um, like PE. Include skill vocational training classes, ESL or English as a second language classes, ABE, adult basic education and literacy, CED, high school remediation classes, work experience, vocational experience, programs that are offered through the local career link, and community service. Spend some time talking about. So, in community service opportunities, um, we really are hoping that um, you and your partners in the community will be able to help uh, ABODs and the department by creating opportunities for individuals to participate in community service activities. By volunteering with a nonprofit or a government site, an ABOD is able to qualify by working off their SNAP grant. And the way it works is you do the fair labor, labor standards calculation using the fair SNAP grant amount divided by the minimum wage, which is around $7.25 an hour. 
So an individual who would be participating in community service in order to meet the requirement would be um, needed to be 26, approximately 26 hours a month of community service. How it works is that we're creating, a, we have community service forms, some of you may be familiar with them now. We're working on forms that um, hopefully won't be quite as onerous um, for individuals participating as ABOD. And so uh, we hope to have those out before ABOD requirements, ABOD are actually required to participate in March. And once we have them finalized, they'll be posted on the, the website that Bill Weaves earlier mentioned, uh, OCLS, Best Harvest, and the like. So if you're an agency willing and able to provide community service opportunities, you complete that form for us. It'll be a one-page um, simple form. Um, testing to the fact that you're providing this opportunity for the individual and then um, assuring thereafter that the individual continues to participate. Uh, it, would, it would be, uh, it would be a, a benefit of, um, for the individuals if you were able to create additional community service slots for us. What if an ABOD works fewer than 20 hours a week on the next slide, please? If the job is scheduled for 20 hours a week, but the, uh, the ABOD individual misses a few hours through no fault of their own, maybe uh, sickness, transportation, holidays, those types of things, um, they should report that, those instances, to the CAO, and then they will be reviewed for good cause by the caseworker in order to continue to qualify for SNAP. If the regularly scheduled hours of participation are less than 20 hours a week, then there would be a requirement that additional activities be engaged in, such as volunteering or training, to get that individual up to 20 hours a week. Um, I know earlier, um, Sandy may mention that job search doesn't count as an activity. It would count as a 10-hour activity to be um, combined with something else that doesn't count as a 20-hour a week activity, though. And so that concludes uh, these slides. I'm going to um, turn it over to Rochelle at this point. Rochelle? Uh, this is actually Kalena Tomhave. I'm an oh. Emerson Center Fellow at Just Harvest, and I, I'm working with Rochelle on this project. And unfortunately, she's um, unavailable right now, so I'll talk a little about our project. So, um, so Just Harvest in Pittsburgh, uh, we are working on an outreach effort for all of Allegheny County to put together a coalition of nonprofits where ABODs will be able to complete their worker volunteer hour requirement. And so the way we're doing this is just really focused on outreach and education. So reaching out to nonprofits that we already have connections with or nonprofits through the Greater Pittsburgh Nonprofit Partnership um, and educating them about the issue because many of them have no idea what's going on and letting them know how they can help and be helped in return by offering volunteer spots for ABODs uh, which would only be, of course, about six hours a week, and um, and how they can then have uh, volunteers in their organization doing much needed work. Um, and so how exactly would we uh, bring this to ABOD's attention? Uh, next slide. Thanks. Uh, so the main way we're looking at it right now is working with 211 of Southwestern Pennsylvania. And so we will be able to submit all of our partners and all of um, their volunteer opportunities to 211. And phone representatives will be able to uh, match ABODs that call. All they have to do is call 211 and match them to a community service opportunity that is near them and that uh, they have this skill level for. And so this will be really helpful for ABODs that uh, don't have access to a computer, and as we know, um, many of them will have limited education, so they may not even have much computer knowledge. And um, 211 representatives will also be able to tell ABODs about the special supportive services that uh, that SNAP clients can get. You know, so if if someone needs transportation, uh, a bus pass to complete their community service, the 211 representative can tell them about that. Um, next slide. And we are also working with Volunteer Match, which is really easy. It is one of the biggest volunteer listing websites. And, um, and so we're, we're just going to be listing the volunteer opportunities online and also on our website. And um, something interesting to note is if you get Volunteer Match Premium, which uh, is only like $75 a year, 
uh, you can very easily list all of your volunteer opportunities on your own website. And so all of those volunteer opportunities will also be listed on our website so that ABODs won't have to go to volunteermatch.org and search. They can just look through all of the possibilities for Allegheny County on Just Harvest website. Um, and so we're really hoping to have this online service available as well as 2 one available by February 1. Um, next slide. And um, finally, regaining SNAP after a cutoff. If unfortunately an ABOD um, loses their SNAP, they can always reapply and get SNAP back if they become exempt, um, which includes, of course, moving to an area with a geographic waiver, meeting the work requirement, um, if they develop a disability in some way. Um, and if, even if they don't otherwise qualify, they can also get another three months of SNAP back if in any 30-day period. Since they last had SNAP, they've worked 80 hours. And um, it can even be less than a 30-day period. If they've worked 80 hours or participated in a training program for 80 hours, they can have uh, three more consecutive months of SNAP. Of SNAP. And um, the new three-year period for all ABODs will start January 1, 2018. And so that's when the clock resets and the new three-year period starts. And so ABODs that have lost their SNAP will be able to uh, start their clock again January 1, 2018. Okay, so we have um, one question already in the queue, but for people who don't know, they can um, type in questions in the box and we will try to get through those. Okay, um, so the first question that we have is, are there some type of community service that would not be counted towards the limit? For example, if somebody helps seniors carry groceries from their home. Hi, this is Pamela from DHS. Um, we're looking right now that our community service definition it, it needs to occur at a 5013C or a government entity, um, but we are looking at that definition, um, and so perhaps before March we'll be able to make a change to include something like that, uh, but that is not currently the case. Okay, um, the next question is, can a person appeal and keep benefits going beyond the three months? Um, uh, Sandy, why don't you go ahead? Yes. Um, so a person can appeal the decision to um, to have the benefits terminated, depending on the time that the appeal is received, is whether the benefits would continue or not. But it is a possibility that the, the benefits could continue. And then if um, the hearing is conducted and it's found in the, in the CAO's favor, then there would possibly be an overpayment. Okay, um, the next question is, what is a process to get a training program approved? Um, if you're talking about a community service opportunity, then you would complete, the agency would need to complete the community service form that we're working on. If it's a training program in, that, in which you're looking for a, a contract with the department to offer services, training services to multiple uh, individuals to receive SNAP and or TANF, that has to go through the RFA process. So we periodically put out RFAs on the DGS website, Department of General Services. Um, so if you're a training provider, you should um, be trolling that website um, periodically to see if there are grant opportunities available. Uh, Tamla, this is Louise. I'm, it, it may be that the person is also asking about what if an individual is enrolled in a training program? How do they get that uh, approved by the department as a form of exemption? You just need, okay, if that's, if that's the question, then you would just need to inform your um, caseworker at the county systems office as to what you're doing so that they can um, you know, notate that in the record and, you know, code it appropriately so the individual is required to participate in something other. Okay, um, the next question, are AmeriCorps workers included in the exemptions? Uh, We're going to have to look into that one. Yeah, are AmeriCorps workers a form of VISTA? Yeah, I don't, this is Louise. I don't know off the top of my head. I believe they are a form of VISTA, and it depends. There's two different categories of VISTA. If you look at slide 
sorry, I have to find which slide it's on. Because um, currently, income for some VISTAs counts towards SNAP as countable income, and income for another division of VISTA does not. So it's on slide 11, full-time VISTA volunteer under Title I DVSA. That is what I'm not clear on which VISTA that is. But um, so for some VISTAs, uh, they their work as a, in an employment training program, it counts, so they would not be um, required to do additional work hours, but for another class of, of VISTAs, they will not be automatically exempt, um, but if they're doing enough hours, they just have to report the hours. So I think it's just more about whether you're exempt from your classification or whether you're exempt for the hours you're doing enough hours and show that you can, you can, you're volunteering those hours and then you're covered. And this is Sandy, I would just um, like to add, in situations like that, I would just encourage um, individuals to share everything with the CAO workers that they're currently involved in and let the CAO make that determination for them what's involved and what's not involved, or what can be counted or what cannot be counted. Okay, um, the next question we have is, is the Community Service Agency Agreement available anywhere at this time? The department's community service form that currently exists is one that we use for TANF and SNAP participants in our ongoing re employment and training reset program. We are currently drafting um, a simplified form for the ABOD requirement, um, and that one is not yet available. Okay. Um, people who are volunteering, do they have to live within the same, do they have to be volunteering within the same county they live in? No, they don't. Okay. Um, will training and employment opportunity information for other counties in southwestern Pennsylvania be available through 211, or is there another source for that information? The county assistance offices um, in the non-waived areas will be able to provide the employment and training information for, for the ABOS that reside in their county. Um, in terms of the 211, I'm not sure uh, Caitlin or Rochelle would have to answer that. Okay. Um, the next question is about caseworkers determining obvious disabilities. Um, is there any concern about abuse for that? Is there any sort of criteria in place for caseworkers to use? So that has um, definitely been the, the struggle with the obvious, um, obviously unfit. Um, we are looking at giving caseworkers some type of guidance on that, and, and our, our direction is going to be mostly to turn to your supervisor if you need additional um, if you need additional um, help in determining if a person is obviously unfit, we also are going to um, suggest doing reviews of these cases just to make sure that there's no abuse. So there is going to be some internal monitoring of the um, obviously unfit abuse so that it's not being abused. But yeah, that, that is a difficult, it's difficult because it's up to each person's kind of interpretation. Um, this oh, is just I Louise. I just want to mention that uh, um, it does seem sort of uh, disturbing and p potential for abuse, but uh, really we all want folks to be exempt. <laughs> um, and uh, so somebody being labeled as obviously unfit for work is to their benefit because they, it keeps their SNAP um, uh, when they might otherwise lose them. Uh, and Louise, that is a, a really good point. And um, just to reiterate, even though the caseworkers are making this determination, we still do have very thorough review processes that we have in place, not only in the CAO level, but in a headquarters level. So we will be monitoring to make sure that you know um, there's there's as much as we can control. There's not abuse going on with this um, obviously unfit process. Okay, um, the next question is whether or not ABODs will need to reapply every three months to keep a SNAP case open. So, um, I'm not, I don't really understand the question, but um, 
if a person is if a person is not meeting an exemption, so if they're exempt, they um, apply and then they receive benefits, and they you know just go through the normal process of of what receiving benefits entails, you know, um, annual, semi-annual renewals. If they're meeting the work requirements, then um, they're just providing the information. Um, they go through what's called simplified reporting. So as long as they're meeting the work requirement, they would just report if something changes drastically. Um, if a person is an ABOT and is not meeting the requirements or is not exempt, then they would get the three months worth of benefits and then their benefit would close and then they would have to come back and reapply if they meet that, um, you know, working 80 hours within a period of time then they would um, reapply again. But if they have not met that, then yes, they, they could reapply, but um, they would have to prove that they're either meeting, an exemption, meeting the work requirement or exempt after that um, initial um, three months if they do the 80 hours within a 30-day period. Did that answer the question? Um, if that person, if their question is not answered, feel free to send us a message, um, ask another question, or send a, a chat message. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next question is: Are county level estimates available for number of individuals currently receiving benefits who are expected to be terminated? Not currently. We are working on that, um, so they will be eventually, but we don't have them today. Okay. Um, is an able-bodied full-time college student uh, considered an ABOD? Are they exempt or not? Um, this is Louise. There, um, uh, there is an exemption for people enrolled in education or training at least half time. So if a full-time college student um, is receiving SNAP benefits, then they are exempt. Um, there are rules about some full-time college students don't qualify for SNAP at all, but if they have navigated that hurdle, then they should not be cut off as an ABOD. Okay. If the clock, if the clock stops ticking for an ABOD mid-month or after one or two months of usage, do they still have 15 days or remaining time left for other use? Um, this is Louise. Anybody who is exempt for any, even a partial month, that month should not count against the three-month time limit. That's correct, Louise. OK. Um, the next person asks, I recall seeing in the handbook that an ABOD is exempt if a child is in their household, even if the child is ineligible for SNAP. Is this still the case? Um, is there any examples of this? So that's a um, that's that's a good question. So the example that we gave earlier, I'll I'll, I'll kind of go through it really quickly. If the child um, is in your household and you um, it's your child or you purchase and prepare your meals together with somebody who has the child, then you will be considered exempt. The child can be an NS member, so the child themselves may not necessarily be receiving a SNAP um, be counted in the SNAP household as an, um, an eligible member, but they would still be in the household. So the household count, for example, would be still the mother, the father, and the child, or the mother, the child, and the boyfriend. So as long as the child is counted in the household, whether they're eligible or a non-specified relative in the household, you would still be exempt. It's when the child is not in the household at all. So you have your food stamp budget, and it's just you or it's you with no child in the household then you, you would not be considered exempt. OK, the next person asks, is there a DHS communications plan set up to implement this new rule? Yes, we've been working, um, obviously, as Sandy pointed out earlier, we were uh, training with the CAOs. We've, the press office, we've been um, involved with with them in um, the different phases of, of implementation. Um, we are sending out, preparing to send out mailers to uh, individuals who may be required to participate, individuals in non, in currently waived areas. Um, we are working on informational flyers for community-based and faith-based organizations and intend to hold some town hall meetings related to it um, in the next few months. So there, there is a plan. And we also have some information that will be shared on websites also about um, 
the A box. Okay. Um, the next person asks whether or not an attorney can certify a client as having an obvious disability. We'll, 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 look in, we'll look into that one. Okay. Um, the next person says, hold on a second. Um, the next person asks, please clarify the travel time to work ETP. So if an individual has to um, drive or, or take transportation that's more than two hours round trip, to an employment and training location because of um, the remoteness of where they reside, they would be considered exempt. Okay. Um, the next question is about, so they just want to clarify that the right to AVOD requirement um, is if they work, it's 20 hours, but the alternative volunteer hour requirement varies by how much they get in benefits? Yes, that's correct. It's a, the maximum benefit amount for one person would mean that they had to do approximately six hours a week of community service. Um, if they get a lesser amount of SNAP benefits than that, then that amount would also decrease. The amount required to participate would decrease. Okay. Um, for the school and training programs, is part-time defined by the county or the institution where the training is received? Part-time is decided by the institution. Okay. Um, is an individual who pays child support for a child not living in the home considered an ABOD? If, if the only requirement, if the um, only exemption they have is just the child in the household, no, they would not. Okay. Um, how often will ABOD be required to report their community service hours? on a monthly basis. Okay. Would a good cause form from a DV shelter be considered an exemption? Yes, it would, it would constitute you know, enough verification for an individual to be considered an exemption. Okay. Um, have there been any numbers of how many SNAP recipients are dropped from SNAP through this type of program? That may have already been answered. Um, we haven't had ABODs in Pennsylvania since 2009, so I don't know that we've, um, we have any current data. I think anecdotally we hear from other states um, about their participation rate. Um, the states that have already started their ABOD requirements, they generally are saying that it's a 20 to 25 percent participation rate, so it's a very low rate, and we hope to do um, much better than that in Pennsylvania. So uh, in part, that's one of the reasons we need all of your help. What is considered a drug and alcohol treatment program, and how is that tracked by the CAO? Um, there are several forms that we have in the CAO that can track um, drug and alcohol. There is a medical assessment form. There is a drug and alcohol form. And there's a series of questions on that form that the um, individual will take to their drug and alcohol treatment center to determine what type of drug and alcohol services they're receiving. Okay, so this, um, another person wants to know, so will college students, um, will they still need to work 20 hours per week after clearing the ABOD rule hurdle? No, if they're participating in college, and they have study time and such that adds up to the 20 hours, that could meet, meet their participation requirement. There isn't an additional work activity requirement on top of the college participation. Okay. If somebody is both volunteering and using hours from work or from class, do they need 20 hours combined or 26? 20. The ABOD requirement is 20. And this is Louise. Just to be clear, that when we talk about 26, that's 26 hours a month, 
Um, that's the $194 monthly grant divided by the minimum wage adds up to 26 hours a month or six and a half hours a week um, as opposed to the 20 hour a week uh, requirement for people who are in uh, training or work. Okay, um, the next question is, can a person receive expedited services for SNAP after the receipt of their three months as an ABOD? So that's a good question. Um, yes, you can, if a person is determined as being eligible for expedited SNAP after they've received their three months, they could um, potentially receive expedited SNAP. Now, part of receiving expedited SNAP means that you are potentially eligible for the ongoing um, benefits. So during that review, the worker would have to determine um, and have the conversation with the individual to determine that they're either meeting an exemption or they're meeting a work requirement. They may not have to provide the proof for the expedited services, but for the ongoing benefits, they would have to have that, um, that verification if needed. Okay, the next question is, will there be any changes to Compass SNAP or paper applications to reflect the ABOD requirements? Not at this time. Okay. Next question. Are some nonprofit agencies being, or are they going to be certified to determine eligibility? No. That's still a CAO caseworker function. Okay. Regarding volunteer hours, how will confirmation or validation of the hours be completed? depends on um, how the hours are, are being met. Um, if it's through work, then uh, pay stubs or uh, confirmation from employer. If it's volunteer service, community service, the agency would, would complete a form indicating the hours the individuals worked. If it's school, we'd need a, a, um, a class schedule. So it depends on the activity. Okay. Um, would an ABOD be exempt if they had a child in the household who is over 18 that has a physical or mental disability that makes them dependent on the ABOD? So yeah, because, they, because they're caring for an ill or incapacitated person in the same household, they could be exempt, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, due to the many barriers, would an ex-offender be exempt from this rule? Um, not not just based on that. I mean, there could be other vari variations, like that person could probably go down the obviously unfit exemption, but not just based on being ex an ex-offender. Okay, the next question is, can you describe what an organization has to do to get a training program that they're currently running approved? Are there county lists of approved training programs? So if it's a training program where they want to offer a community service slot, then um, you need to let um, the county assistance office know that you have those opportunities available. Um, post on your, your website if you're in Allegheny. As we heard earlier, we certainly want you to connect with Just Harvest and get that on their site and on 211. Um, if it's a not, com not a community service slot, but perhaps a job training that you're offering, um, the way to get those approved as um, a, a job training provider with DHS is to um, make application when we have requests for applications posted on the Department of General Services website. Okay. The next question is, since the three-month clock resets every time a client completes the ABOS requirement in a given month, would there be any penalty for a client who simply refreshed the clock once every three months? Can you repeat that question for me? Yeah. Um, since the three-month clock resets every time a client completes the ABOS requirement in a given month, um, would there be any penalty for a client who simply refreshed the clock once every three months? Oh, I think so. It's saying that if they if they have this um, three-month time that they can have the SNAP benefits, um, and that three months keeps going in the future every time the client completes the requirements. Um, could they 
No, I'm sorry, I don't understand the uh, question. Whoever wrote that in, if you could um, maybe clarify that a little bit, we'll answer the other questions and come back to that. Okay, um, so the next question is, is the list of cities with geographic waivers going to change at all, or is the list, the final list approved um, in the cities which time limit will not apply? No, the waiver information, as Louise indicated uh, uh, early in our call, was we just received information from FNS uh, uh, within a few minutes of the, the start of the call. So we need to, after the call, we need to comb through that and see um, what's been approved and what has not been approved. Um, but what you have currently is not the final uh, document. We'll, we'll be putting that out, you know, within hopefully uh, short order. Okay, um, the next question is, what proof is required if someone is expected to return to work in 60 days? Well, I would think if they're, um, they could get something from the employer to, you know, to whom they're going to return, um, just indicating that that would be sufficient. Okay, um, next question is, do you need a criminal background check to be able to complete volunteering hours as an ABOD? Depends on your work. Your organization is required typically to have um, your volunteers have criminal background checks, uh, then yes, an ABOD would need that as well. Uh, some organizations, as you know, are exempt from that requirement, uh, so it really depends on, on your agency. Okay. Um, next question is, are there any estimates on the increased number of people who will be using food pantries after this program is fully implemented um, after June? We really have, until we uh, get started with our ABODs and we see what percentage of individuals are participating, um, you know, it's really just a guess as to how many, um, you know, might lose the requirement and then might be in need of that type of service. Okay. Um, if an ABOD does not meet any exemptions in the three-month period, do they have to wait 36 months until they can reapply if they qualify for an exemption before the 36 months is up? No, they do not have to wait. If they qualify, if they um, have an exemption, they can reapply and just verify that exemption if it's needed to be verified. Okay. Um, are there any more questions? Does anyone have questions? Because um, otherwise, I think it's time for us to wrap this up. Okay. Wait. Um, the person who asked that question uh, just sent a clarifying question. So let's try to this. Um, the question is this: A non-exempt client gets three months worth of benefits. In the third month, the client completes the ABOD requirement for that month, um, earning them another three months' worth of benefits. Could a client repeat this process over and over again so that to receive benefits for a full year, the client only needs to complete the ABOD requirement for separate months? So I believe what, what the person's asking is if you look at slide 26 about even if someone doesn't otherwise qualify, they can get another three months if in any 30-day period since the last, they last got snapped, they worked 80 hours or participated. The question is how many times is that reset good during the three-year period? Can they only do that once where they've used their three months, then they meet the requirement and get the reset three months? Or could they, in effect, do that multiple times over a three-year period? Thank you for clarifying that. They can only um, get that um, additional three months one time. Um, and this is Louise. I think the question um, sort of misunderstands the nature of the three-month time limit. Maybe we haven't explained it. But you get three months um, out of a, a three-year period, and they don't have to be continuous, or at least the, the initial three months do not have to be continuous. So if somebody is an ABOD who is not exempt and gets two months of benefits, and then in the third month, um, uh, work 80 hours, does community service, whatever, in for the third month, then they've gotten two of their three months, um, and the third month doesn't count, but, at, but they only have one more month remaining of the three months. Um, so if in month four they are not, don't, meet an exemption and don't meet any of the um, uh, work requirements, then they, that turns out to be their third um, month. 
That's a good point, Louise. Yes, the the three months do not have to be continued, right? Um, consecutive. Um, and you don't trigger a new three month period by, um, by working in a third month. Right. Okay, that was the so, question I had. Oh. Great. And this is Louise. This is we're at noon. Thank you all for participating. Thank you especially to Sandy and Pamela for uh, patiently answering all these questions and being really terrific. Um, and to the Budget and Policy Center for hosting this webinar for us. Um, as the slide shows, um, CLS and the Hunger Coalition both have created um, web pages uh, with, that will have this webinar on them as well as other materials as they um, are developed. And CLS's web page already has a one-page client flyer that was developed by our friends at CADCOM and a two-page more detailed um, handout for service providers like you all. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate your um, help with making sure that people um, get their food stamps next year. Thanks a lot. Bye.